Hi, Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer, Executive Vice President, and the co-founder of the nonprofit CLL Society here at ASH 2022 in New Orleans. Hi, um, my name is Claire Sun. Um, I'm an associate research physician at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. Well, Dr. Sun, the BTK inhibitors, starting with ibrutinib, have revolutionized the care of CLL over the last 10 years. That's a recurrent theme. But they're not without their risks. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the most serious risk is dying from them. And unfortunately, that does happen, and sometimes it's a sudden death. So you've done some research on ibrutinib-associated sudden death in patients with CLL that you'll be presenting here at ASH. Could you explain a little bit of why you decided to do this large retrospective study? What questions did you want to answer? And maybe just define for patients what do we mean by sudden death and what, what, do, we what do we think is the usual cause of that? Sure, um, maybe I can work my way backwards. Please. Um, sudden death is, as the name uh, describes, um, de suddenly dying um, without um, usually an obvious uh, cause, often unwitnessed. And um, in most cases, we think of sudden death um, as um, caused by cardiac arrhythmias, so an abnormal yeah. heart rhythm. Um, so the heart isn't successfully pumping blood, getting blood to the brain and getting blood to the heart itself. Right, right. Um, so, you know, ibrutinib has been associated with side effects um, of abnormal heart rhythm, most commonly atrial fibrillation. But in, with more and more experience, we're starting to appreciate that it can cause abnormal heart rhythm in the, in the larger chambers of the heart or the ventricles as well and as well as sudden death. So there have been pooled analysis that show that ibrutinib is associated with an increased risk. And um, we have been working with ibrutinib for more than 10 years now. So we wanted to describe our own experience at the NIH and what we've observed in patients treated on ibrutinib-based therapy at our center. So just in setting this up, the heart has the four chambers, and the atriums are the minor chambers, that, um, and when they don't work well, that's dangerous, and blood clots can form, and strokes can develop, and the heart, you can get into heart failure, but it's generally not a life-threatening, urgent situation. But the ventricles, the large chambers, and the left ventricle specifically that pumps the blood to the body, if it isn't working, you don't have long on this planet, is that, and that's the concern, right, that, you know, ibrutinib might be not just affecting the atrium, but also the ventricles, and specifically the left ventricle. Am I getting that right? That's exactly right. Um, it is more dangerous to have an abnormal rhythm in the ventricle because it's the, it's the, ch it's the chambers that pump blood through the rest of the body. And um, in particular, ventricular arrhythmia, what we're concerned about is when it enters this rhythm that doesn't self-terminate. So in effect, it's quivering, it's not pumping blood, and eventually this can become lethal. Okay, and that's ventricular fibrillation, which is mm -hmm. like a cardiac arrest. Yeah. Right, exactly. So um, you, the questions, you, what questions were you trying to get to with this, and what was the population that you were studying uh, when you were doing this research? So we focused on our patients um, who were treated with ibrutinib, whether in combination or as a single agent, um, in the last 10 years at the NIH. Um, and um, together, I think there were about 130 patients that we've treated so far. And it's, it's one thing to you know, recall sudden death anecdotally, but we wanted to do a systematic um, analysis of our patients and looking at what that rate of sudden death is um, compared to the age match population, as well as what others have reported with ibrutinib-treated patients. So uh, I'm eager, what were the results? What did you find? So um, we did have a number of sudden deaths, and um, in total, we, we observed patients. So each patient observed for a year, we call a patient year. 
So we have a total of 640 years of patient year data that we looked at. And what we calculated was a risk of sudden death of about 800 per 100,000 patient years. And um, that compares um, similarly to what a report that came out of the Dana-Farber some years ago, where they calcul estimated the rate of sudden death also around 800, I think it was the high 700s per 100,000 patient years. Um, and that's significantly higher than what we would expect in the age match population. That's actually usually below 150 um, cardiac sudden deaths per 100,000 patient years of observation. So, so that risk is, you know, if we just crudely estimate, um, it's, it's roughly, you know, four to five fold higher than what we would expect from the age match population. Of course, you know, we haven't robustly done the statistics. This is a historical cohort that we're referencing. So um, I, I don't want to, you know, make uh, strong statements about the actual relative risks, but what we observed was, was that there are about, I think, less than 4%, 3.7% of patients who were treated with ibrutinib-based therapies who died suddenly at our center. So I think what you're saying here is that the relative risk compared to the general population, and these are often elderly patients who are at higher risk for sudden death than a young person, was significantly higher, four or five-fold, but the absolute risk was still relatively small. That's right. So what does this mean for patients and what, I mean, this has got to stimulate you to do other research. What other, what would you like to see in terms of research to help patients lower their risk? Yeah, so that's a that's the million dollar question, trying to identify those patients who are at risk of sudden death and avoid ibrutinib or altogether. So um, we are actually uh, in the process of opening up a prospective study where we uh, do um, comprehensive cardiac testing on patients starting brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors um, and following them longitudinally longitudinally to try to um, assess for predictors of um, significant or serious cardiac uh, side effects, including sudden death. So you'll be doing a cardiac workup on patients like EKGs or echocardiograms, Is, am I getting that right? Yes. That kind of thing? Yeah, we're doing, in addition to that, we're doing stress testing um, and we're doing um, cardiac ambulatory EKG. So, um, like a two-week EKG, essentially. And the, the goal is to you know, do these tests before BTKIs are started, during BTKI therapy, and then follow them for um, outcome. And when do you anticipate this trial will be opening? Um, I'm hoping before the end of the calendar year. Oh, well, that's yeah. soon, yeah. We've been working so, on it for a while, so. so. So please send us the news and so we can put a link in on the website to the trial. And so patients who are considering a BTK inhibitor could go to the NIH and enroll in this trial. Is that right? Or is it going to be, is it going to be beyond uh, Bethesda or is it going to? Right now we're still, um, we're starting with a single center. Um, mm -hmm. But the work of actually, um, I mean, it's right now it's written as a single center, but um, I, I'm hoping that perhaps we could do some of these testing even locally so patients uh, don't have to travel all the way to Maryland to get these tests done. So any, this is really important, really exciting, because these drugs have helped patients incredibly, but they do have this small but <laughs> incredibly serious risk. Um, what any final thoughts you have for patients related to this research and uh, your perspective on the cardiac problems um, or risks with ibrutinib? Yeah, so I mean, I think increasingly I am looking at the patient's cardiac risk factors before I s put somebody on treatment. And if they have significant risk factors such as high blood pressure, pre existing atrial fibrillation, or, you know, heart attacks. I do try to avoid ibrutinib, um, and there, are, there is also a recent report from the Ohio State that suggests maybe even a calibrutinib can cause some of these um, toxicities as well. So um, luckily, you know, we have venetoclax now that's also very effective in CLL. So for those patients 
where I think that maybe the cardiac risks are too um, high. Um, I, I do try to steer them toward venetoclax-based therapies. Dr. San, I'm, I'm so appreciative of the work you and your team are doing at the National Institutes of Health. It's, it's, it's great to see you again, and uh, please keep us appraised on these studies that you're doing uh, so we can make sure that the patients can benefit from them. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.